Hi, we are the Ghana family and we go to the 845 service. Some uh, things that have been helping us through the lockdown was um, going on some mountain bike riding with the family um, and yeah, watching some Olympics together. And um, we also did a few walks and we went to the park a bit. Um, we're finding this lockdown easier than the first time um, because the first time we didn't have our own place, we were in uh, Airbnbs and not settled. Uh, we still find it challenging. Charlene can't go to work and the boys can't go to school. Um, yeah, but at least it's easier than the first lockdown. Um, I would like to encourage you with a verse from the Amplified Version of the Bible. It's Hebrew 13 verse 5. Um, it says, I will never, under any circumstances, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake, or let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Um, this verse just encouraged me so much in the first, in the first lockdown. Um, I think we were still in Airbnb at this stage, and even though I've heard this verse so many times in my life, this time when I read it out of the Amplified Version, it just meant so much more to me and really helped with my anxiety, um, everything flaring up. So I pray and I hope that it will encourage you. And you know, I'll be all thinking of, of our lovely church family and we're praying for all of you. And we hope that everything goes well and that you will feel God's love around you. Blessings. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Church Online from wherever it is that you join us. Uh, my name's Travis and it is so good to have you with us today. And wasn't it lovely to start our service just by hearing from some of our church family about how they're experiencing and navigating this lockdown. And thank you for those encouragements at the end there as well. You know, one of the things that I've been doing with a couple of other of our young adult community is just reading the Bible together. And there's something so lovely about feeling connected, knowing that I'm reading the exact same chapter of the Bible as somebody else. Um, we've already worked through the book of Job and we're pretty close to finishing up Romans now. And there's even a little online group where some of us have a conversation about what we sense God speaking to us. And so I invite you at home to be thinking through that same sort of question of, of what life-giving, faith-building practices can I be putting into place during lockdown because that can be a time let's be honest that tests us and there's days where we feel the weight or we sense our anxiety starting to rise up within us so what life-giving faith building practices is it really important for us to include in our lives right now but as we've been reading through the book of Job and the book of Romans as young adults one of the themes that's come up a couple of times is the idea of the sovereignty of God of just how big and powerful and in control our Creator God is. And it's elicited in me and in a few others this sense of deeper trust and dependence and peace, knowing that He is in control. And so I invite you into a time of worship now where we respond to God and we worship Him out of that space. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Only our holy God. So our response is to worship Him. And as we lead into this time, I've invited Jo just to, to read aloud what she wrote for one of her artworks in the recent art installation that speaks into this as well. So thank you, Jo, and then I invite you to worship with us. The waves on the rocks remind me of three things about our God of wonders. The waves washing over the rocks reminds me of his grace, which I do not deserve. The grace that forgives and covers every sin of my flesh and grants me a new beginning each morning. As distant as the east is from the west, that is how far he has removed our sins from us. The sound of each wave following the next reminded me of the steadfast love that the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end and they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. After every wave upon the rocks followed another, again and again and again, never ending. I was reminded of his faithfulness and love that never ceases. 
but restores my soul each and every morning. And the ocean reminds me that part of this world is untouched, although the shoreline is filled with homes, cities and crowded streets, so little of the ocean is discovered. Just as Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know, I pray that you will be able to know that love, then you can be filled with the fullness of God. What an amazing and wondrous God we have.
Thank you so much, worship team. And thank you for enabling us as a church family to continue worshiping together even while we are physically apart. It's such an important expression of our common faith. Well, in terms of church news and things coming up in the life of our church, one is particularly urgent because it's happening Sunday, 15th of August at 3 p.m., which is the week where this service goes live. So ladies, I warmly invite you to finding calm in the chaos. This is a chance to jump online together to connect with other ladies from the life of PBC and also receive some great input and exercises that'll help center you on God in the midst of increased anxiety. And doesn't that seem particularly relevant to us and our world today? So it's 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon. The link's in your e-newsletter, and hopefully many of you will be able to make that. 
then coming up in a fortnight, we have our next church meeting. This will be Sunday, 29th of August at 11 a.m. And obviously, it will be online as well. Great chance for us to connect and to talk through all things ministry and the life of PBC, from welcoming members to talking about finances to talking about how lockdown is affecting things. And crucially, we will continue uh, making forward momentum on our hub redevelopment. So hope to see many of you online then as well. Now, the next big one coming up is our PeaceWise Everyday Peacemaking Conference on September 11. Now, I can confirm that this will shift online and be an online conference. Uh, numbers are capped, so I really encourage you to register soon uh, if you're planning on attending. Um, this is subsidised, and that's just an expression of our conviction as a church family of just how important it is for believers of Jesus to be those who make peace and are peace in every relationship and workplace, every space where God has placed them. This is going to be a really personally equipping conference, so I encourage you to sign up. And if you're on the fence, well, we're going to hear from Bronwyn now, who has recently done it, and just hear how she experienced this conference. My name is Bronwyn, and I'm here to tell you about why I enjoyed the Everyday Peacemaking course. So over the years, I've seen the hurt and grief that can be caused by conflict. And I also know that at times I've caused those uh, wounds to other people when I've not responded to conflict in a helpful way. In January, I read a book called The, P the Peacemaker, and it reminded me that my role as a Christian is to be salt and light to the world. I completed the Everyday Peacemaking course in June, and I found that it linked really well with the book. I was reminded that conflict is part of living in a fallen world. Conflict comes from misunderstandings, it comes from differences in values, and it comes from competition. It comes from competition for resources. The thing is, it's how we respond to conflict that makes the difference. I did a one-day course, and I'm not going to tell you that it was all easy. Parts of it were hard. I had to think about what my role is in conflict, and I had to think about the importance of apologising and accepting responsibility when I cause conflict. But I was also reminded that when I follow biblical principles in handling conflict, I can shine out to other people and make a difference. I can move towards living at peace with people and being a witness for Christ in this world. I found the course to be practical. I found it to be encouraging. And I'm really glad that I invested the time in doing the course. And I'd like to commend it to all of you. Thank you, Bronwyn. So there you go. Make sure you sign up to Everyday Peacemaking. You can do that through the link in the e-newsletter or under the upcoming events section of our website. But right now, I'm going to hand over to Steve. And as I do, just want to give us all a moment's pause because I think it's really important for us to prepare our hearts and our minds to tune in and to listen to what God has to say to each of us. So just take a moment in personal prayer and preparation for God's word being spoken over us today. Welcome, and thanks for joining us as we continue in our series on the minor prophets and the message that they had. Five weeks ago, when we began this series, we started looking at just the themes that were running through many of their messages. It would start with an accusation. The prophets would confront the people of God with their sin, confront them with their breaking of the covenant of God. That would then lead to a call to repentance. Turn back from your ways and turn back to God. God himself would call his people, come back to me. And the third theme that runs through is the consequences of the breaking of the covenant. That there would be judgment if they would not turn back to God. In the middle of this series, so we've, had four, we've looked at four prophets, we have four to come. Uh, we just want to pause and actually look at this aspect of covenant. It's such an important part of the message of the prophets, not just the minor prophets, uh, but the other prophets in scripture as well. 
And to talk about covenant, we also need to talk about promise and we need to talk about kingdom. But firstly, let's start with covenant. Now, covenants were widely used in ancient times. They took various forms, but they essentially acted like our contracts. They were agreements made under an oath between different parties. Now, sometimes the parties were equals, so it was a mutual um, agreement, a mutual covenant. But other times, the parties were definitely not equal. And so we have covenants made between kings and their people, or a covenant made between a king and a conquered, a conquered nation. And in those covenants, it's not mutual at all. It's very much, well, here's the way it is. You either accept it or not. In the covenants, there are blessings for complying with the covenant, and there are also curses if you don't comply with the covenants. And often in the making of a covenant, an animal would be slaughtered, an animal would be killed as a dramatic way of saying, may this happen to me if I do not comply with the terms of this covenant. Now the Bible itself contains dozens and dozens of covenants. And the Hebrew word that we translate into covenant carries a meaning of something like that which binds two parties together. And the root word of that Hebrew word is something like to eat bread with and that lovely it's a very relational phrase to eat bread with someone and so the covenants we find in our scriptures have this relational dimension to them so covenants whilst similar in some ways to our contracts are different in that they either establish a relationship or they recognize a relationship between the two parties now i don't know if you've ever entered into a contract but if you're buying or selling a house it's unlikely that you're about to enter into a relationship or it recognizes a relationship that you already have with the person that you're buying or selling the house from and if you have to borrow money to do that Again, you're not generally going to sit down and eat bread with your broker or with the bank. It's purely business. Now, most of the covenants we find in Scripture were made between men. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they all entered into covenants with others. And King David entered into numerous co covenants. Perhaps the best known is the covenant he made with Jonathan, King Saul's son. There were also covenants which God made with men, with David, or with Solomon. And in fact, God made a covenant with all of creation after the flood in Genesis. But when the prophets speak of the covenant being broken, the covenant they're referring to is the covenant that God made with his people after he brought them out of Egypt. And we find the story of this and the details of the covenant in the books from Exodus through to Deuteronomy. And often this is referred to simply as the law. Now, this covenant that God makes with his people is not a covenant made between equals. It is a covenant made between a king and his people. God is king, and so God initiates the covenant, and God determines the content of the covenant. He tells them who he is, and he tells them what he has done for them, and therefore what response is required of them. So in Exodus chapter 19, God says this to the people. He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you out, my, or out, brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In Exodus 20 is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. And God speaks all these words. He starts by saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So he, again, he describes what he's done. And then it's like, therefore, and he enters into the Ten Commandments, starting with, you shall have no other gods before me. And so it continues. When we get to Exodus 24, the terms of the covenant, the conditions of the covenant uh, have been outlined and we're told that Moses took half of the blood and he put it in bowls. So again, there's been a sacrifice uh, to symbolize the obligations of taking on this covenant. He puts half the blood in the bowls and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, 
sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. The blood being a dramatic way of the people understanding the consequences of breaking the covenant. Now at this point, I need you to understand something really important. When were the people who came out of Egypt, when were they saved? Well, they were saved before the Ten Commandments were given, before the covenant was made. I remember hearing a guest preacher uh, many years ago, and they preached that to be saved, you had to obey the Ten Commandments. And the pastor who was present at the time, who'd invited this guest speaker, was furious because that's simply not true. And it never has been true. I've heard other people say that the Old Testament is all about law, but the New Testament, well, that's all about grace. Again, that is simply not true. The exodus of God's people out of Egypt into the Promised Land was an act of salvation by grace. The law comes after the nation has been saved by the gracious act of God. The law is given so that the people know how to respond in worship and in obedience to their gracious God. The law describes what it means to live in holiness and righteousness and justice and kindness. The law describes what it looks like to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, and to love our neighbours as ourselves. You see, the law is good. But when we start believing that it is our keeping of the law that saves us, then we've misunderstood it. And this is where we need to understand the word promise. Because the promise is the foundation of the covenant. Why did God graciously save his people from Egypt? He did so because of the promise that he made long before. He says this to Moses in Exodus chapter 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And this is really key. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. God made this promise to Abram, as he was known then in Genesis chapter 12. Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this is simply an act of grace. God promises to Abram that from Abram he will make a people, he will make a nation who will be blessed by God to bring a blessing to all people on earth. And it's this promise that becomes the foundation of the covenant that we read of between God and Abram in Genesis chapter 15. But again, the covenant is all about grace. The promise is wholly of grace. Nothing was asked of Abram other than faith. God says to him, I will build a nation from you. And it's written that Abram believed the Lord and God credited it, to him, credited it to him as righteousness. When Abram was 99 and he received his new name, Abraham, the Lord confirmed his covenant with him and commanded Abraham, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Keep my covenant. You see, the foundation of the covenant is the eternal promise, the eternal promise of a gracious God that I will be your God and you will be my people. And where I am, there you will be with me. 
Israel was called by God to obey the covenant, to keep the covenant, to walk in the covenant. But the prophets said that instead the people forgot the covenant, they broke the covenant, they rejected the covenant, they profaned the covenant. And yet even with that, the message of the prophets is that even though the covenant has been broken, the promise does not end. There is accusation, there is a call for repentance, and there is the, the warning of judgment. But with all of that in the prophets, uh, they hope for God to do a new work because the promise of God, even though the covenant is broken, the promise of God does not fail. And so when we read through the prophetic writings, we see the, prophetic, the prophets speaking into this newness. The prophets speak of judgment, of a new captivity, uh, that God's people will be taken from their home and they will go into exile into Assyria and into Babylon and into Egypt. But then the prophets also speak of a new exodus, that they will return to the land that the Lord has given them. The prophets speak of a new covenant, different from the old covenant, but still the gracious work of God. The prophets speak of a new nation that would be drawn from all peoples of the earth and they speak of a new creation. There are so many passages uh, from the prophetic writings uh, that speak of this new covenant, that speak of this newness, uh, but just a, a sample of them. From Isaiah chapter 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. And in verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take you of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. Well-known words from Jeremiah from chapter 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And this phrase again, I will be their God and they will be my people. You see, the promise is there and the promise will give rise to a new covenant, one very different from the one before. Ezekiel picks up these same themes. He talks about the, the exodus, the new exodus as people come back. He says, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to follow my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. And again, it finishes by saying, you will be my people and I will be your God. In the next chapter of Ezekiel, he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. You see, the covenant is broken, but the promise does not fail. The foundation of the covenant is the promise. And the foundation and the fruit of the covenant is the kingdom of God. Simply put, the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. The kingdom of God, God's people in God's place under God's rule. And into this expectation of the kingdom of God coming, this new covenant being made, the restoration of what was and more, we have Jesus. Jesus comes preaching that the kingdom of God has come near. We have Jesus teaching constantly about the kingdom of God, what it looks like. We have Jesus claiming to be greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, the ones who received the covenants of old. 
we have Jesus saying that he did not come to abolish the law or abolish the prophets, but to fulfill them. We have Jesus reading from Isaiah chapter 61 saying, This has come true today, speaking of himself. We have Jesus the night before he is crucified, taking bread. And when he had given thanks, he breaks it, gives it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, take and eat. And then he takes a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Don't ever fall into the mistake of thinking that Jesus was God's plan B because the law didn't work. Jesus was not plan B. The plan was always Jesus. All that came before Jesus was but a shadow of what had already been prepared for us. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the prophets and he is the perfecter of our salvation. Des is going to read to us from a couple of passages from Hebrews. Today's Bible reading comes from Hebrews 6, 13 to 17, and Hebrews 9, 11 to 15. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what he said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Hebrews 9, 11-15 But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Now the New Testament writers, and especially the writer of Hebrews, makes it very, very clear that Jesus is both the bringer of the covenant, the mediator of the new covenant, as well as being the perfect sacrifice on which the new covenant is established. The new covenant is built on the same foundational promise, that I will be your God and you will be my people. But it's not just a slight improvement. Uh, they write about how it is far superior to the old covenant. Now last year, I traded in my old Yaris and I bought myself a new car. Do you know what I bought? I bought myself another Yaris. I sit in it, it kind of feels like my old Yaris, it kind of drives like my old Yaris. It's got a few more bits and pieces, but effectively I'm still driving the same car. That's not what the new covenant is. The new covenant is not just the old covenant upgraded a little bit. The new covenant is more like replacing my Yaris with a Tesla. It is far superior. It is a greater covenant. It is a more perfect sacrifice. The Apostle Paul makes the same point. He talks about uh, the covenant made on Mount Sinai and he compares it to with the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant that Christ brings. He says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in ladders on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? 
If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? You see, there is no comparison. The new covenant established by the blood of Jesus Christ as the writer of Hebrews will say, makes the old obsolete. I want to wrap up here. There's so much more I could talk about, but I can't. And I want to wrap up by just saying, so what? So what that there is a new covenant? What does this mean for you and I? Two things. And the first is this. The new covenant means that all who place their faith in Christ, all all who place their faith in Christ have a new identity. And that identity is that we are heirs to the promise. That I will be their God and they will be my people. You see, we are that people. Paul makes it so clear in Galatians. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And then he says this incredible thing. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, Abraham's son, Abraham's daughter, and therefore heirs according to the promise. Peter makes a similar point. In 1 Peter he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, there is an inheritance that we receive, not of land, not of something earthly, but a spiritual, a heavenly inheritance that awaits us. You see, through this, through faith in Christ, we receive this new identity, that we are heirs of the promise. And with that comes the promise of forgiveness. With that comes the promise of being in the presence of God forever. And with that comes the promise of God's Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That is who we are in Christ. And my second point is simply this, that under this new covenant that we, are, uh, that we have received, our new identity, we are called to walk in it. In this way, our response is to be the same as those who were before us, who received a covenant, they were called to walk in it, and so must we. All of the covenants are based on grace, grace, and so what is asked of us as we walk in it is to have faith in God, to trust Him to trust his promise. As well as having faith in God, we're called to love him, to worship him, and to live in obedience to him. And we're called to love and to show kindness to, to exercise righteousness and justice toward one another. That is how we are called to live in response to being made heirs of the promise. And my heart coming out of this sermon is simply this that we would know who we are in Christ, that we are heirs of the promise, heirs of the promise that goes all the way back to Abraham. And secondly, that we would be encouraged to walk it out. And that as we walk it out, that it would be to the glory of God and to the building of his kingdom. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. you Lord oh your mercy never fails me oh my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up 
Till I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led darkest nights you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God in all my life you have been faithful in all my life you have been so Thank you for joining us for Church Online today. You know, one of the things as a church community that we really value every time we gather is the ability to connect with each other. Now that gets pretty hard when we're all in lockdown and when the gathering happens online digitally. And so my encouragement to you is that as the service finishes now, pick up the phone and reach out and connect with someone else from the life of PBC. Share with them what it was that you sensed God speaking to you through today's message. And maybe you will also want to share how you personally are experiencing and navigating this current lockdown. Come up with them of practical ways that, that can be life-giving and faith-building that you could be doing this week. Well, we miss you. We love you. We're praying for you. And we're hoping to see you all again soon. God bless.